Three weeks to polling day and counting. Tonight, it's our penultimate leader interview. Sinn Féin's Mary Lou Macdonald is live in the studio. Welcome to The View. Tonight, Sinn Féin says people aren't waking up thinking about Irish unity, but would a vote for the party be an endorsement of a border poll? The party's president, Mary Lou Macdonald, joins me in the studio. Listening closely and standing by to bring us live reaction and analysis, Vanilla O'Connor and Newton Emerson. And with Partygate fines issued at Westminster, we'll ask if Boris Johnson's premiership has now reached the beginning of the end. Hello, the DUP says Republicans would use an election victory to pursue a border poll, but Sinn Féin says its current focus is on the cost of living. What's going on? Let's find out. Sinn Féin President Mary Lou Macdonald is with me now. Welcome to the programme. Is that the message you want the electorate to hear then over the next three weeks? Um, this election time is not about a border poll, it's about the cost of living crisis. Well, um... Can I firstly say, uh, Mark, that I'm very conscious that the, the deaths of two men in, in Sligo Town, Michael Snee and Aidan Moffat, have caused huge alarm and fear and distress right across the community, and not least in the LGBTQ community. So I'd like to begin, if I might, by sending condolences and solidarity to their families, to the wider community. And I know there will be a lot of vigils, um, and books of condolences and solidarity in coming days. And I think that's a very important factor and facet of Irish life now as we seek to build a sense of community, collaboration, partnership right across our society. And that, in a broader political sense, is Sinn Féin's uh, priority. We're very conscious that people are currently living through a cost of living crisis, we're conscious of the enormous waiting lists, for example, within our hospital system. And we're absolutely determined that politics will deliver for people. We also believe that, meanwhile, politics delivers in a respectful sense of partnership in the here and now, that we also have to plan for the future. And that conversation about the future has to include everybody. Um, and yes, that involves the prospect of constitutional change. But at its heart, the conversation is about how do we do things better? Okay, how so, do we so make life better? So is a vote for, for Sinn Féin uh, on May the 5th in the Assembly election here a vote to support your policy on waiting lists and on the cost of living crisis, or is it also an endorsement of your position on a border poll? It, it is all of the above. And, you know, the, the great thing is that human beings are capable about, of thinking about, planning for, in some cases, worrying about more than one thing at one time. So it is entirely not just possible, but necessary to deal with politics, political realities in the here and now. Mm -hmm and to respond to them so, so in a Michelle way that's proportionate. So when Michelle O'Neill talked about people not waking up thinking about a border poll but thinking about the cost of living crisis, w w was she slightly off message as no, far no, as you're concerned? No, 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 absolutely Because that's not, not the kind of thing we're used to hearing Sinn Féin leaders saying. No, no, she was absolutely right because the truth is in the here and now if you're struggling to pay your electricity bill or put food on the table, if you're one of the 400,000 people who are on a waiting list waiting for a first consultation, of course that's to the forefront of your mind but that does not mean that you're not concerned about the future and it certainly cannot mean that as a society that we don't plan for it that future. Okay so the is this a tactical approach then? That. Is that what we're looking at? Avoid no. talking where possible about a border poll which you still clearly want mm -hmm. in case you frighten the unionist horses and help them get their vote out? No far from it. It's a recognition of the reality yeah. that we are Because that's what the DUP thinks. Well, well, with all due respect, then, the, the DUP are wrong. Um, the, the, the facts are that we're dealing with an, infl uh, an inflation spiral, the likes of which we haven't seen since the 1980s. The facts are that families, workers, communities are struggling and politics has to deliver. You have to deliver in the here and now. And 
alongside that, you have to plan for the future. And let me repeat, the two things go hand in hand. The one complements the, the, the other. And we're very anxious to see institutions back up and running and for us to no longer judge success by the simple survival of the institutions, yeah. but by in their capacity to deliver. OK, but unionists are concerned that if Sinn Féin ends up as the biggest party on May the 6th, you, you will use that as leverage to catapult the issue of a border poll back to the top of the agenda again. Mark, we're, we're nearly a quarter of a century now into the Good Friday Agreement. I mean, the idea that a discussion about what happens next and the future is somehow catapulting anybody anywhere is not a reflection of, of reality. Well, we've never had a Sinn Féin First Minister what before. We, what, and, and we may do so. We might so. have one on we, May the we 6th. May do, we may do so on, on May the 6th. And so that's, we've never had that situation that's, in 25 that's years. In that's the, the hands, point. Uh, that's in the hands uh, of the people. And if it is a thing, if it is a thing, that uh, the people return Sinn Féin as the largest party. Well, then we will nominate uh, Michelle O'Neill as First Minister, and that will be a democratic verdict. But uh, outside of that question, we have had these political arrangements now, as I say, for almost a quarter of okay. a century. And at this point, uh, I think with all of the changes internationally, domestically, not least Brexit and all that that has entailed, of course we have to have a conversation okay. about this. All right. You, you, you said in your opening comments that um, this election has to be about Sinn Féin delivering for um, your supporters. So let's talk about delivery. Last night in a television interview in Dublin, you said, and I'll quote, ministers have to be in charge of their departments. At the end of the day, the buck stops with them. That means they need to be on their game. They need to be alert to what's happening around them. So let's just look, if you don't mind, for a moment or two at the performance of Sinn Féin's executive ministers. The audit office here in Northern Ireland said recently that the communities department and Sport NI were working at speed regarding help for sports clubs during COVID restrictions. But it did point out that the department was underwriting some organisations' profits, which it said was wasn't an appropriate use of public money. Does the buck stop with Deirdre Hargy? Yes, the buck stops with any minister and any department. And I know that the Comptroller and Auditor General, quite correctly, keeps a very, very careful eye on all public monies. I, I spent many years on the Public Accounts Committee in Dublin, um, and I had dealings with Kieran Donnelly here, the, the outgoing Comptroller. So quite correctly, mm. everything is weighed and balanced. But just bear in mind, um, what, what was also found and understood was in the context of COVID, that departments were moving at speed. And whereas a cap should have been put on that fund and one or two organisations, one golfing institution yeah. in particular, um, benefited from that. They operated within the rules and many, many other hundreds of other sporting organisations benefited from those yeah, monies. Rules set and Mark, within and a Mark, department you know, by they, they a, a department led by a Sinn Féin minister. That's the point. Yeah. The report that you refer to also said, while the minister's intention was to support a diverse range of sports clubs, golf clubs, as you say, yes. ended up benefiting the most. One and a half million pounds was paid to Royal County Down Golf Club, the largest single payment that was made. Now, that happened in a Sinn Féin minister's department. Was Deirdre Hargy on her game, to quote you, allowing Deirdre that to happen? Har Deirdre Hargy has been very much on her game. And any fair-minded person looking in the context of the, the COVID pandemic, the distribution of more than £2 billion... Why did she, see, pounds, why did she not see two, the need for a sorry, cap? £2 billion pounds being made and the incredible positive effect that had for business, for community organisations and for sporting organisations would acknowledge the Deirdre. But in fairness, let me make a broader point, the entirety of the executive, to everybody's credit, in the main, rose to the challenge. And I think fair-minded people would, would recognise that. Yeah, but she could have the, done better. The objective, would, you, would you go that far? Of course, would you admit I think that? She would, I think she would accept herself that there should have been a cap. But the purpose of scrutiny of public monies, of having a public accounts committee and a comptroller and auditor yeah. general, is that you establish... Sure, but it's better not to make a mistake be, in the first place, isn't it? Well, it, uh, of course it is. And it would have been better if we weren't dealing in, in pandemic circumstances where decisions had to be made very carefully. But let me emphasise this point. 
Nobody acted outside of the rules. No, 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 I so know there's that. learnings yeah, to be drawn sure. for sure. But, but, but what about the people sure. who've been queuing up to try to get help with winter fuel payments, which is a scheme also administered by, by Deirdre Hargey's department, and struggling to do that because that's a scheme that was under a huge amount of pressure. Uh, and they're looking at, you know, privileged golf clubs um, with, with money in their accounts mm -hmm. being handed hundreds of thousands of pounds. In the case we've just referenced, a million and a half pounds. And they'll say, was Deirdre Hargey's department really acting in our interest? Well, I, I think anybody who's struggling, um, and I've met them uh, not just in the, in the course of the election campaign, but far, you know, months uh, before that, out and about, recognise that Deirdre Hargey, perhaps above and beyond any other minister in the executive, has acted in good faith and solidarity particularly with families that were struggling. So I don't think that's a fair reflection of her work. And well, I, she set I don't... Up a scheme. Let's talk about that scheme. Um, the department set up a scheme offering emergency winter fuel payments earlier in the year. So up to 300,000 people trying to access support from a scheme that could only process 330 applications per day. What kind of scheme was that? Yeah, uh, and, it was a and, flawed scheme. And well, it, 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 it demonstrates two things. Firstly, the level of need in the community. Uh, and secondly, the fact, and I don't like this fact, but it is a fact, the system here in the North, uh, north operates from a block grant. You don't have all of the levers and powers that, for example, you would enjoy in Dublin in terms of raising resources and then resourcing your system appropriately. And yes, things were stretched and people were under pressure. And, and the minister said that herself. I don't just, think there's just to any quote her. Okay, she that. said in the Stormont Chamber herself that a scheme that's targeting 20,000 people with a demand of over 280,000 trying to contact the scheme will never be fit for purpose. It was never intended to do that. But it was a scheme set up by her department. Does yeah. the buck stop with her? Yes, but I mean, she's, she's addressed the matter. She has acknowledged the matter that, of course, in her ministerial position, her primary concern and her primary goal has been to support families, particularly that are struggling. I don't think that's a matter of okay. contention. So do you think David Na Harvey's neither, performance is a, is a good neither, advert for Sinn Féin ministers I, delivering I, for the people? I, I think her performance ha has been a very, very strong one. Even and, when you reflect on what we've just been talking about for five minutes? I, I, have, I have said to you that schemes, the imperfections of the schemes, I have acknowledged, Deirdre has acknowledged, the there's nobody denying that and, and lessons have to be learned from that. Yeah. I've also said to you that that happened at, at a moment of very great pressure. But, but above all else, and I can attest to this, out on the ground amongst those citizens who most rely on a minister having a sense of connection with where people are at and the struggles that they're facing. Nobody surpasses Deirdre Hargey well, do, in that do you think? Regard. Do you think if you were one of the 300,000 people looking for support from that winter fuel payment scheme and you knew that 330 people were being dealt with in any one day, you'd I would think be, that she was delivering good I, I, value for money? Listen to in the best possible if, if way. I, if I was one of those families struggling, and there are many of them possibly watching this interview who are, I would be very, very um, frustrated at the fact that uh, because we operate to a block grant and because resourcing has to follow that, I would be very eager to hear political leaders plan for the future and the means by which we get greater okay. powers, Slightly separate great issue. access, greater... Well, it's not separate. It's, it's all very much okay. connected. Well, let's talk about health. Let's move yeah. on, which is also sure. connected and also um, something that, that your party has had some significant say in in recent years. Your colleague, um, Sinead Ennis, has a big poster up in, in Newry. Daisy Hill Hospital, protect our services. But just to go back to the morning of the publication of the Bengoa report on health service reform, when the then health minister, Michelle O'Neill, um, was commenting on that. She said there's strong evidence that concentrating specialist procedures and services in a small number of sites produces significantly better outcomes. Mm -hmm. Adopting this approach will mean that not every service will be available in every existing hospital, but where those services exist, each and every one of us will benefit from more timely, safer and better outcomes. Has anybody explained that to Sinead Ennis? Yes, Sinead Dennis, and, and indeed those everybody, Sinead and everybody else campaigning for Daisy Hill Hospital are well aware of that. And by the way, they're not looking for every service to be available. They are advocating the point that in a very, very large population area that spans uh, across uh, South Down and into Newry and Irma and indeed over the border into North Monaghan and, and into 
uh, Louth, there is a concentration of population and there but has to be But that's a separate issue from the Ben Goa report, which is about reform and transformation of a health service within Northern Ireland. Yes, yes. I'm not saying it's not connected to cross-border issues, no, but no, that's no. not what Ben Goa addresses. No, no, I know you, what Ben Goa, I know what Ben Goa addresses. Yeah. And there is, it, it, similarly, Sláin Chikair in, in the South addresses the fact that, yes, you need centres of excellence, um, for specialities, that is absolutely sure. But that is not a uh, cover to denude entire areas of the services that they can legitimately expect. Can I say this to you, Mark? Last weekend, a young woman died in that area of Newry because a, an ambulance couldn't get to her quickly enough. A young woman in her 30s. Now, that said to that community correctly, in my view, that the services that you need in your local hospital in Daisy Hill, you guard them and you argue for their development. Not every speciality under the sun, but the services that your complex, community requires. That's a very, requires. very tragic it, it, incident. It, There's absolutely it, it no is, question it is, about well, that. Well, Mark, it's complex, but it's also simple. And the simple reality is, in emergencies, you cannot say to a community, the golden hour will be protected by ambulance services and capacity, which doesn't exist. Mm. And this is one of the big frustrations. We're talking specifically in respect of Daisy Hill. I know these frustrations are felt elsewhere across the north. And that's the reason why we have committed one billion uh, pounds extra in investment in the health service. Conor Murphy has set that out in the draft budget. Yeah, which, we which, have hasn't, said, been agreed, which hasn't been agreed. Well, well the, the draft budget was, is the costed plan for actually delivering this one billion of additional spending. And bear in mind, back at the time of new decade, new approach, Everybody agreed that health would be the priority. As far as we're okay, concerned, just... health is still the priority. So, so, so if and you go Connor, back into government Connor, again, that, the, the same, the same, okay, so the same demand will be made on the other government departments if if um, you end up with finance again, if there is an executive after May the 5th, and you will want other departments to, to trim their sale to allow that extra money to go to health. Well, That's unchanged, is it? Well, yeah, but well, I, I, I don't see that as a demand. No, no, I'm just asking. I mean, no, no, and I'm just... And just answering okay. 400,000 people are on waiting lists waiting for their first consultation that's nearly what a third of the population on waiting lists I've cited you that tragic incident last yeah. weekend so either health is the priority or it's not we had agreed that it was we are sticking to that position and Conor Murphy, to his credit, as finance okay. minister, one last put his, one. his money where his All right, One last question on this. It, again, it, it, it affects the same area. At the end of February, plans to temporarily remove emergency general surgery from Daisy Hill in the city of Newry came into effect. Services were consolidated at Craig Avon Area Hospital to maintain safety of service. That was a decision taken by clinicians. Do you support Absolutely. that decision? I will always support any decision that guarantees patient safety. Even if there's, it's unpopular a, for local politicians? There, there is no issue. There, there is no no sensible or sane person who will argue against patient safety. But let me also say this: there is also a case to be made and and a conundrum around resourcing and recruiting the number of clinicians into the likes of Daisy Hill okay. Hospital that in turn feeds patient safety. It's all about throughput. Right. It's all about maintaining clinical excellence. And if you aren't recruiting or if you for some reason can't recruit in the numbers that are required to a hospital like Daisy Hill, you are going to find yourself in difficulties. Okay. But le let me say all of this points to the fact we don't have enough nurses, enough doctors, enough therapists, enough clinicians within this system. And that needs to get fixed. And the only way you fix that, Mark, is by saying very clearly, Health, as agreed, remains the priority. We have committed okay, well, uh, you've, to you've one billion that point and, addition, as well. and we will right, stick okay. by that. Um, presumably this um, weekend's Easter commemorations um, won't be focusing on the cost of living as far as Republicans are concerned. Will you be asking Sinn Féin speakers to weigh their words very carefully because there is presumably a potential electoral cost of not getting things quite right? Will you be trying to make sure nobody says anything to incentivise the unionist vote? Well, look, I mean, our job in this in this campaign is to set out our political stall. And um, we've set it out very clearly, as you say, in respect of responses to the cost of living crisis, the health crisis. 
but also the need to build opportunity, prosperity for everybody across society, the need to work in partnership and to work in collaboration, the absolute pressing need to have functioning, a functioning executive and a very That's dynamic really assembly. The question I asked. With well, the greatest respect, presumably you also want to win votes in an election and not antagonise your opponents. But, you know, that's a very strange way of coming at an election well, campaign. I have, like it. I mean, I think it's a reasonable question. But I have, ne I have never uh, fought an election as a candidate or, or a wider election uh, worrying about antagonising somebody else's vote. The, the idea of political campaigns is it's a battle of ideas and proposals and visions of where we are and where we need to yeah, be. But you want That's to avoid a crocodile moment, don't you? I mean, we've, we've heard well, at Easter commemorations in the past, members of Sinn Féin say things that make unionists extremely uncomfortable. I'm just asking you a simple question. Will you be trying to stop that happening we this weekend be, because we're only three week, week, weeks away Mark, from an election? Every, it's that every, simple. every Easter, we celebrate Easter. We reflect on the Easter proclamation, the inclusive... Uh, proclamation that addressed itself to every Irish man, woman and child and set out a blueprint for an egalitarian, inclusive, fair and united society. That's what Easter is all about. And Easter for Republicans is a very special time. Yeah. And the focus will be on speaking to that Republican sentiment. And by the way, I think those sentiments travel well beyond the Republican heartlands right. and the Republican So, so let me base. give you an example. I've got, I've got okay. a few quotes in front of me. I'll pick one. Back in 2015, Jerry Kelly spoke at the Milltown commemoration in Belfast and he said he wanted to pay tribute to the bravery, leadership and commitment of the IRA who fought in the streets of our towns and in the highways, byways and fields of our countryside. On a personal note, he said, I think I can speak for many thousands of Irish Republicans who came through the conflict when I say we are proud of our time as volunteers in the Irish Republican Army. Are we going to hear stuff like that this weekend? Well, you, you are going to hear a Republican vision and sentiment around the future of Ireland. And every every uh, easter equally is that, is that a yes or a no every easter equally remembrance is paid to volunteers that fought for irish freedom going way back way way before by the way jerry kelly's time and that'll happen all across might ireland might be toned down this year in an effort not to offend unionists come here the, the objective is never it's the, the objective here is not to offend anybody no, i'm asking you uh, about an objective not to offend. Well, my objective will always be not to offend. I don't think anybody, any reasonable person sets so you out want to, hear something like to, that this to offend. What I want to hear is the language of the future. This election is about the future. Okay. It is about society's capacity, not just simply to move on in a trite way, but to move to actually collectively right. well, envision let, let, let me, let me how about things the future, can be. Where we might have, we might have a Sinn Féin first minister for the first term. The, the Financial Times reported recently the UK government is apparently interested in creating joint first minister positions at Stormont as part of a review of devolution. So over the past few years, Sinn Féin has consistently referred to your colleague Michelle O'Neill as the joint first minister. Back in 2015, Martin McGuinness formally suggested the, do the job titles should both be changed to joint first minister, formally changed to that. Has your position changed on that, perhaps because polls suggest you could be on course to take that job? So um, Martin didn't get a very positive response to his proposal at that time. The office is a joint office. That's the, that's the legal reality. Would you like reality. to see the titles changed to reflect that? That is the legal that. reality of it. I tell you what I would like to see. I would like to see proof positive that everybody involved is up for power sharing. I would like to see political unionism, all of it, demonstrate in word and deed right. that they well, are up for power sharing. Do you think you could help unionism sharing? who are, you know, um, maybe a bit spooked by the way things are going at the moment? Could you help unionism to make that commitment by saying, if you do, we will reflect the joint authority of those positions by changing the names to joint first minister? M Mark... What I will do and what I have consistently said to unionist uh, colleagues is that we need to demonstrate that what we have will actually be implemented. Okay. The job at the do, minute... Do you support Martin McGuinness's proposals from 2015 job, to formally change the job the titles? Job, That's a straight yes no, or I'm no. No, I'm not proposing that we change the job okay, titles. So the position of Sinn Féin has changed? The, well, Martin made the proposal yeah, at the time, and at the time... And it's it not your back. position tonight? Well, here's, here's the position, the objective position is this is that um, we, we need to ensure 
that what we have agreed okay. actually can get implemented at e the executive even though, means. Even though Sinn Féin has consistently in the last mandate referred to Michelle O'Neill as Joint First Minister, and, you don't now formally and, want to And, and listen, I have no objection. I have no objection whatsoever in anybody at okay, any stage right. reflecting the jointry of the office. Okay, you but, don't think that's hypocritical? But, but no, no, no. I, I, I tell you what, what, what might be construed as very hypocritical. 20, for 24 years, Sinn Féin has served... Um, or, or, or thereabout, quickly, has, has, has served in a joint office. Now, the question is, can political unions and can okay, the we'll DUP see. actually similarly serve? Okay. And that's a democratic test for them. Right. Okay. And we, we, I hope we'll maybe they, get an answer to I, that in the fortnight. I hope they win. If, if yeah. the DUP is sitting in the seat that you're sitting in tonight. We need to leave okay. it there. We're out of time. Thank you. Appreciate your time. Thank you very much indeed. Let's get some analysis of what we've just heard from Fanula O'Connor and Newton Emerson. Welcome to both of you. Fanula, um, what do you take from that? Hmm. Well, I, I, I was a bit baffled, to, to be honest, Mark, um, at your talk. Um, I did think it was an odd way to approach uh, the woman who came to, to, to answer questions on behalf of Sinn Féin as their leader, instead of Michelle O'Neill, who is the northern leader, as of course she's perfectly right to do, and it's Sinn Féin's point always that they are the only 24 county uh, party, sorry, 32 county party uh, operating here. Um, but to, to ask her repeatedly if she wanted to uh, avoid offending unionists, if she wanted to appeal to unionists, instead of um, putting her on the spot, uh, I would have liked to hear her talk about how she hoped to expand Sinn Féin's vote, how she hoped Sinn Féin would hang on to the vote they've got and expand it, rather than possibly lose uh, seats, as they may do. They, they came off a very high point uh, last time in freakish circumstances because of, largely of Arlene Foster's crocodile thing, many people thought. Um, and at the minute, they are, they are um, helped enormously by unionist bad behaviour. Um, so it, it seemed an odd tack. Uh, it did it did leave her a bit flummoxed, I think, as well. Manila, never she, mind she what I asked. Ease. What about the answers we got from Mary Lou, if you don't mind? Well, I, I think she was ill at ease at times. I think she was uneasy, or she she was slightly flummoxed by by some of it, but. Uh, on on the rest, I, I mean, you, you pinned her down on the on the on the details of uh, uh, Deirdre Hardy's decisions, and uh, no harm in that. Very good idea. I okay. just would have you, liked you, to. Let have me heard. ask you: uh, Was that, uh, from your perspective, a persuasive, consistent performance by the Sinn Féin president? Well, it was uh, it was playing it safe and uh, and doing a very good job of that. Uh, this is Sinn Féin's election to lose, it appears, due to the due to the the DUP meltdown. So, playing it safe is the correct strategy. I think it's more about trying to uh, get alliance and SDLP transfers than worrying about uh, about offending unionism as such. Uh, unionism is offended anyway. But uh, the, there is an air of unreality that hangs over this sort of real issue strategy and that we don't know if the executive is going to come back after May because the DUP has made it quite clear it's not going to return if the protocol isn't changed and probably won't return if Sinn Féin is the largest party. So downplaying the constitutional issue is fine, but we've got a, a, an institutional issue now rising about whether there will be an executive and the Alliance Party has put that to the fore by proposing reforms, not the first minister changing the first minister, Minister titles, that's, uh, that, that, that's, that's just a minor detail. It's about tweaking mandatory and adjusting and reforming mandatory coalition, something that was meant to happen years ago under the agreement's own terms. If that issue comes to the fore, I think that puts Sinn Féin on the spot. When it wants to talk about detail and policy, is it going to do what's necessary to reform the executive to deliver it? Um, Fanula, what, what do you make of um, the argument advanced by Mary Lou Macdonald there for referring consistently to Michelle O'Neill as Joint First Minister throughout her time as Deputy First Minister, but now apparently rowing back from Martin McGuinness's position, formally stated in 2015 that the posts should be redesignated as Joint First Minister. Well, uh, as she said, it was thrown back at him at the time, so the, there wasn't much going for it. Um, there is the, the point that they always have been joint, uh, that the SDLP negotiated it uh, in a way that they felt, the only way they felt David Trimble would accept it, um, by, by allowing him to be First Minister. Um, I, I don't really see that she could have done anything else. There is a big, strong uh, disgust out there in the nationalist world at the way unionists have behaved and at the refusal by unionist leaders to contemplate being deputy first. So to say in 
in these circumstances, yeah, uh, I, I, I think that we should we should stick to the joint thing and we should actually make it formal now. That would be a mistake for her, and she didn't she didn't make that mistake. Um, Newton, what do you imagine unionists will make of Mary Lou McDonald's contribution tonight? What in general? Um, yeah. <laughs> well, um, I think that. Uh, the, that, that there'll be, uh, you know, uh, uh, the first question I suppose they'll, they'll ask is where is Michelle O'Neill? Uh, that, uh, that that idea that uh, that uh, Sinn Féin is an All Ireland party is probably a little bit uh, at odds with the unionist perception of how Stormont works and how it operates. You're, you're not technically quite correct there, or Fanula wasn't on Sinn Féin being the only 32 county party. Uh, obviously, the Green Party is uh, is a, is a uh, Northern Ireland branch as well. Sorry, I should have said the main well. parties. The main, yeah. the main party, the main yes. Uh, I, I suppose that uh, it should be pointed out to you, Nis, that okay. uh, it is perfectly normal for Sinn Féin to present its its All Ireland leader on a programme like this. Okay, need to leave it there, folks. Thanks both very much indeed. For now, we'll uh, talk again at the end of.